one of the things you probably don't know is we got a new camera. And Jan's been trying to, to box me in up here. She says you're moving too much. You know, you go over this way, you go over this way. She bought a wide angle camera, so I can go. You showed me this morning, I go all the way over the piano that way, and all the way over to the end of the system. So he said nothing's out of bounds. You know, I know how I get when I get wound up. So this is all right. Just thought I'd throw that in there. <laughs> You wonder what pastors talk about when they go home, you know, after Sunday, you know, that, that's kind of it. You, you need to stand still. <laughs> Today is Heritage Sunday. It's a day that we reflect upon our identity as Christians, what's really, really, really important. If we strip back everything else, what do we stand for? What are we anchored to? And how, what does it mean? And so this picture that I got off the, the, the web shows a cornerstone that was preserved in one of the ancient buildings in Europe someplace. I'm not even sure it told where it was, but that would be important. But what's I, the idea is you can see how all the smaller stones, and some of them are pretty good, are all anchored in a particular way to the one big stone. And so, as we think about this Heritage Sun Sunday and our identity in Christ and think about the fact that we are Christians, we're going to try to celebrate the fact that that's who we really are. That that's why we gather on Sunday morning. We are uniquely called by Christ to be a particular way. Not necessarily uniquely called by John Wesley, not called by any other particular faith or denomination and we can trace our roots back and we can, and, and I'll do that. But we are called to have an identity in Christ. That we are anchored to Christ and after we strip back everything else, that's what's important. It's kind of funny though that when people want to steal our identity, you know, they want what's in our wallet more than anything else. But wouldn't it be good if we had another wall that we could carry that when they steal our identity, they take that too? Now there's a thought. Maybe we should carry our identity in Christ in our wallet somehow. Something to think about. Because we're going to get there too. We are Methodists. And, and I love teaching church history. If you've been to Methodism 101, you'll understand how I get really excited there about teaching where we come from, how we got from this this meeting with Jesus having his disciples and talking about, I am the way, the truth, the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. If you've seen me, you've seen God. And how we've come from this ragtag group of disciples that are having such a hard time understanding, what? This is hard? We don't get it? How did we get from that understanding to where we are right now sitting here where we think that we've got it so all together and we've got it all figured out. How did we get there in just 2,000 years? And what does it mean? Has our identity in Christ transformed us in a way that's any different than what the people that spent three years traveling with them? Is our understanding any greater than what they had? Or is our understanding, maybe our understanding of our embedded theology that we were taught as children combined with the the listening to me or someone else every Sunday talk about what this really means. When we get back and strip off all this stuff, our Wesleyan considerations, as good as they are, we're gracious people. We love the idea that, that, that the thing that makes us uh, particularly Methodist is the fact that we believe in grace. And we've got the church right next door, as good as it is, it's the Lutheran church, and, and we can go back, and, and John Wesley took a lot of what his the theology, not all of it, from Martin Luther and the Reformation. And in 1968, we, we merged with the, uh, um, with the, the uh, uh, Brethren Church. And so we can trace our roots back through uh, Jacob Albrecht and Martin Bain and a host of others that come from Lancaster area that goes back and, and goes through the Moravian line, back to the Puritans, back to Austria and Germany. 
pre-Reformation time. And then we can go back even further and have certain things that we do and, and, and uh, uh, histories that, and tr traditions that go back through uh, the, uh, the Roman Catholic Church through Pope Leo before the split, before the East and the West decided that they didn't want to be partners anymore. And even further back, for to the, around the, uh, 400 A.D., to the desert dwellers, the, the fathers, the, the Cappadocians that wrote so much of what we come, the profession, our profession of faith this morning, comes from them. Interesting stuff. And we can take it even back further and further and further. We get back to the right here where we're at with the apostolic fathers that, were, that knew him, that traveled with him, that didn't understand him. And the Gospel of John starts off, in the beginning was Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. This Word that was spoken in creation, that brought all into existence, was spoken again, and Christ was there, and the incarnate, the one that comes to reveal the best revelation we have of God, is right there amongst them, and they say, show us the Father. What? Yeah. Jesus has to be so frustrated. So frustrating. Do we do that? Do we have that same problem that his disciples had? Because the, the, I, the disciples were struggling with an identity crisis. <coughs> They're Jewish. They're Jewish. They understand the God of the Old Testament. They understand the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. They understand the God of Elijah, who calls down the fire from heaven and destroy the 400 prophets of Baal. They understand the God who called and brings fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah. They understand the God of Noah. But Jesus, you're more difficult than that. Show us the Father because we're not so sure that this God who is power and might and leads us by the strength of his arm you want us to eat with sinners and to forgive those and you say things like you've heard it said to you should pray for your enemies but I'm telling you not just that you should love your enemies and pray for those that persecute you You've heard it said that you shouldn't commit adultery, but I'm telling you, you shouldn't even look at a woman with lust. And you've heard it said, and on and on and on. And this does not sound a whole lot like the God that they knew. And as much as they know that just Jesus, we know what you're doing, we know all about you, but if you would, just show us the Father and we'll be happy. Show us what we know that we're comfortable with and things will be okay. And once again, you don't get it. I am the Father of one. If you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It's hard. It's hard. And we do, sometimes that we do the same thing because it, that it is so difficult for us <clears throat> to think about this idea of being Christ-like and our identity in Christ and following that which Christ taught us to do. We'd much rather make it easier when we had a list of rules that said this is what we need to do, this is what we need to obey. But Christ that tells us that we should forgive seven times seventy, that's way too much. We have a Christ that says we want you to love people, love your neighbor as yourself. That's even more difficult. We have a Christ that says things that sound so impossible when it comes to dealing with everybody else. When we look at our identity in Christ and that which makes us Christians and look for some sort of way to to tie it back to that which we know to be true. We have to understand that, that where we're at is there are no other, there, that, that Christ uniquely calls us into discipleship. Nobody else. 
not Don Wesley, not Martin May, not Martin Luther. Christ calls us into discipleship. No other, no other suffered and died on the cross for us. Christ is our foundation. No other was, uh, do we have salvation in. No other taught us that, that what we need to do is to be out in this world, to offer. That's what, what we do is we, go, we do a really good job of saying you need Christ in your life. We do a really poor job of offering that. We need to get to where we are not saying come here and learn. We need to go there and teach. I hope that makes sense. In the, in the passage from, from 1 Peter this morning, 1 Peter says it so well. It was a message that Jan gave to the children about being spiritual building blocks. I lived in a town in Indiana that tore up a street once. And they threw all the, the bricks out in Industrial Park in a, in a low area out there. So Jan and I would go out and we'd load up the pickup truck and bring it back. And this street that used to be 3rd Street now became our patio. And I wasn't the only one. <laughs> I wasn't the only one. There was people in the shop that were building these things into the most marvelous thing, into fireplaces and into you know, whatever you could use these bricks for. And they were making... The interesting part about it is, as I thought about that yesterday, I went online because I remembered what they had, the, the markings on it was Culver Block Company. And I had no idea that they're selling these same bricks because that's part of the brick yard. That's part of the pavement, the original pavement that come off the Indianapolis Raceway. And there's no way to tell whether the bricks that's in my patio or the bricks that's in the brick yard are any different. I mean, you had a fortune there, you never know. <laughs> but that's what we are, this idea of being open to the fact of being a spiritual building block. Not a stumbling block. A building block. That we're willing to grow in such a way that we can offer ourselves to be built into whatever it is that Christ would have us be built into for the edification of His church. Because that's why Christ came. Christ came for the salvation. He alone, He alone is the mediator of our faith. He alone intercedes for us. And He alone will be the righteous judge. When He says no one comes to the Father except through me, then it, He alone will have the authority to say, you, not you. It's not us. You see? We're not the ones who point the finger and say, it won't be you. That's up to Christ. Christ will come in, in final victory when, and, and when he comes again, he will be the determiner. Christ will judge the living and the dead. In the meantime, build yourself into a, to, to a spiritual building. The church that offers itself for salvation to all. The ones that we say you need Christ in your life and refuse to offer it. So, how are we going to do this? How will we do this? Peter says also that you have, are God's chosen people, that you may proclaim the mighty acts of Christ, who called you out of darkness and into the light. So how are you going to proclaim? You're going to proclaim the mighty acts, first of all, by your service. And we know this, by your actions, by what you do. Second way is through the use of your gifts. And I hope that you know what your gifts are. Those gifts is that what you are as, as a born, as a born anew, born again Christian, you are gifted. Christ has gifted you through the Holy Spirit with something that only you possess that is wondrously yours. And is not just yours, but is necessary for the edification of this body. It is necessary for the building up of the body of Christ, and only you possess it, and I hope you're using it for that purpose. If you don't know what your gifts are, come talk to me. I got I know pretty much what everybody is. I can I can by talking to you, by getting to know you, we know what your gifts are. Let's use them to build this church up. And also lastly, by your witness. Your witness has a lot to do with uh, not just your mouth, 
but what you do, how you conduct yourself, how you go into the world, where you go. It's a big chore. Christ says many things, but he, what he says is that if you know me, you know God. And we shouldn't be afraid of the fact that, to say that in Christ that we, that we know God. We can understand that. Model the image of Christ. Imitate Christ in your life through your gifts, through your service, through your actions, through your witness, through all that you do. And you will be that spiritual building block. You will be that... I'm not going to call you a bunch of rocks. <laughs> You'll be that building block, not that stumbling block. And that's what we got to get away from. We can't be stumbling blocks. We need to welcome people into this kingdom because that's the kingdom that Christ came to establish. And from what I can tell you, you're doing a good job. <laughs>